And so we've been talking on the subject of history makers. History maker is one that is a creator or a, or a narrative of events of life. In other words, you create something in life that is long-lasting. It's something that is remembered through the years, that, that people look at it and it reminds them of certain things. I, I can mention certain names and certain people, and immediately you go right to that place. And it's easy, it's easy to do. You know, as we look back and, and look at our nation, and, and of course our problem is that in our nation, the last several years, we've tried to destroy history rather than making sure the history stays alive so we can learn and grow from it. Listen, history is just history. It's something that was an event that brought about change. It's an event that affected people's lives. It's an event that we can either learn what to do or what not to do from. I was laughing. I was talking to someone the other day, and, and they were talking about, we were talking about, you know, David and how David would go play the harp and, uh, for Saul and he'd chase all the demonic spirits away and, and give him peace. And, and uh, someone said to me, well, what was, was David being mentored? How to, because he was never a king. David was never a king. He was a shepherd boy. So God put him in the palace so he could learn why a king's supposed to live. I'm about to step on somebody's toes. <laughs> he took a shepherd boy who had only taken care of sheep and put him in a palace so he could learn how to be a king and rule people. Some of you are still trying to stay and be a shepherd, but you want the benefits of the kingdom. Move over here. Hallelujah. Someone said, well, what, 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 what was Saul teaching David? He was teaching him what not to do. Sometimes events in your life is not about what you're supposed to be doing. It's to teach you not to do it anymore. Anybody ever heard you learn from your mistakes? You know, the fool is the one who does it over and over again, never learning from their mistakes, thinking it's going to bring about change. No, it's not going to bring about change. You're just going to keep getting hurt. You know, and I always said this to people, you know, they say, well, you know, I'm just tired of being hurt. I said, then look in the mirror and tell yourself that. Mm, I better go back over here now. <laughs> if I'm hurt over and over again, it's because I'm consistently putting myself in a position so people can hurt me. I've not learned how to handle my life's journey in correct ways. A history maker understands that. The history maker understands that if they're going to make a difference in the world in which they live, then they're going to have to think differently than everyone else. If you're taking notes, write this down and just, just remember this. If you don't ever remember it again, write it down so you can go back and remind yourself of it, okay? Because it's easy to be in church, hear something, get all excited about it, leave, and then we don't remember it later on. Write this down, okay? Kings and queens do not think like peasants, Say, so, what? Write it down. You won't remember it later. And you're going to find yourself acting like a peasant and forgetting that you're a queen or a king. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You've been set forth for the praises unto him. Act like it. If we're going to be history makers, we've got to understand we are who God says that we are. We are exactly who God says that we are. And we, and we get this idea for some reason, we develop this through the years in the church to justify our inability to walk in what God has ordained us to walk in because we've not walked in the structure of the kingdom. The kingdom has structure. God does nothing without purpose, design, and structure. He works in the structure of it. A history maker understands structure. But when we don't walk in that structure, we have to come up with excuses because, you see, we don't want people to know we're not that spiritual. Man, rough crowd. We want people to think that we really are all that. So well, I don't want that. Oh, really? Then why, why do you act the way you do in front of people? Why do you change the way you act in front of certain people? You ever notice that? I was with, I was with a friend of mine that was just, just one of the guys. You know, we went to college together. We did everything together. We, we'd been around each other a lot. It was great. And I remember we came into... A, a place where I introduced him to Dr. Oral Roberts, and all of a sudden he goes, oh, hi, Dr. Roberts, I'm so glad. To, I thought, shut up. I said, Dr. Roberts, that's not who they are. I said, now talk normal. I 
I'm going to look around and say, is that you? Could that possibly be that you change the way you talk and think around certain people because you can't hang on to who you are? Mm. History makers never change their identity. I said history makers will never change their identity. They are who they say they are in spite of the turmoil they face. See, circumstances do not change a history maker. History makers change circumstances. Now, I'm not got to teaching yet. I'm just kind of laying the foundation for where I'm going. But it's imperative that we as believers in Christ realize that we're put here with purpose in mind to bring about change. In other words, if you want to use this term, to leave a legacy. What is the legacy that I'm leaving with my life? Rick Thomas' legacy? No. It's the legacy that God had Rick Thomas live. It's not about remembering me. It's that I set something in place that others can grow from and draw from because I was doing what God called me to do. Mm. See, we have a tendency to call that pride. Well, it's not pride. The Bible says, the psalmist David said this, I will boast in the things of the Lord all the day long. So if you're good at something, celebrate it because God gave you the ability to be good at it. Don't go, oh, well, you know, and, oh, yeah, you can. <laughs> I have a tendency back, especially when I was a youth pastor, maybe you can learn from this, uh, pastor McLeod, that, that when I was a youth pastor, and I'd have people come in, and they were I'd heard about they could do this or that. I go, "Are you any good?" And a lady come in, a young girl come in. She's a pianist, a keyboardist, and I said, "Are you any good?" Well, you know, I said, "No." Are you any good? Well, I said, "You know what? I don't need you. Thank you." And my pastor said to me, "But her family's in the church," and she. I said, "I don't care. I can't have anybody in my youth group playing music who don't know who they are, or how good they are." Oh, I know I'm messing some. I'm going, I'm going to get so much against traditional stuff right now. You are who God says that you are. Amen. You're incredible. Maybe I'm not incredible to anyone else, but I am to God. Yeah. Amen. I'm not trying to please anyone but God. I talked to a young minister this past week, and he's going through a bunch of stuff and fighting a lot of stuff. I'm going, I said, stop it. I said, you're so worried about what people think about you. Please, God, quit pleasing people. When you please God, God will give you favor with people. Finding your identity. Do you, you mean you don't care about I care about people. I love people. But I'm not going home at night going, you know, gee whiz, Mike got upset at me. I could tell the way he looked at me. I know I, I did something. And he, he, he hadn't t- oh, man, and then you carry that around. And then you finally get with Mike three weeks later, and you Mike, I'm sorry, and Mike goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, you know, when I was, I was in, I walked by you, and you, you gave me that look. What look? <laughs> See, that's the insecurity in you that the enemy uses to try and tear you down and stop you from being a history maker. Right. You're designed by God to change the world in which you live. The theme of abundant life is reaching our world with life. The call and the mandate of preaching the gospel is going to all the world and preach the gospel. Glory to God. Amen. So let's let's get over the, the world identification and let's move into the kingdom identification. And begin to move in that. So as history makers, and we're going to talk about that today because I believe that we're moving into something. Last summer, we, we did the month of history makers in the month of June. And we're getting ready for the freedom offering, yes, but it's a freedom service. And we'll talk more about that later. But it's a service that we, we're declaring our freedom, not just as that we're our, our independence of the United States of America, but our independence as children of the Most High God. Whew. I like to look at stuff and things are going all the wrong way and go, wait a minute, I'm independent of that. I don't, I, 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 you know. Yeah, but it's going on. I don't care what's going on or not. I, and I'll tell you a cute story. Some will like it, some won't, but it's still cute. Uh, Miss Sarah talked about my, my, the Thomas family. <laughs> they get it all from her mother. I, I mean, my grandmother, <laughs> Pastor Kathy. Not me. I try and keep everything calm. <laughs> but I, I've got another little child, granddaughter, by the name of Penelope. (laughs) 
Penelope is a very unique person, and believe it or not, she comes up with these things on her own. It's not because her mom has, has, has kind of infiltrated her life and, and put a bunch of stuff in her or because dad, granddad has. Or, it's not that. She's just a free thinker. You got to understand, listen, when the whole COVID thing came out, the school teachers can tell you this. Where's your mask, Penelope? I'm not wearing it. We got to wear the mask, Penelope. I'm not wearing it. Penelope, you have to wear your mask. I don't believe in COVID. <laughs> so the principal, Miss Stacy, comes in and gives her a shield. One of those little shield things. Make me, she'll wear that rather than the mask. Miss Penelope goes, not wearing it. And Miss Stacy says, well, you can see through it. They can see your face. And you, not wearing it makes me look like a nerd. I'm not wearing it. <laughs> Y'all got to picture her? So they're standing in line at Starbucks. My daughter, Parker and Penelope. Heather's getting some coffee or whatever she gets. God only knows. <laughs> I don't hate to go to Starbucks every day, but that's another story altogether. Two people are behind them. There's a man and a lady. And the lady turns around and sees the man. She says, oh, I see you're still wearing your mask. He says, oh, yes, I double mask it. And the lady says, I do too. I just don't understand. You know, if everybody had been wearing masks, we'd have never had a pandemic. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not here to get into all of that. I'm just like giving you the picture. Heather, Parker, Penelope, the woman, the man. And then the man says, well, if everybody got vaxxed, we wouldn't have to worry about this at all. And these people aren't getting vaxxed, they're costing lives. And this is going on in Starbucks. And all of a sudden, little Penelope turns around, she lifts her hand, she says, hey, we're not here to talk politics, we're here to get our coffee, okay? Now, this is a little eight-year-old who has no problem with her identity. She's the same one who told me. She always lifts her hand with it, you know. I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm, I, I, <laughs> to make her mad, I call her Heidi sometimes and tell her her real name was Heidi. And all, you know, and she'll she'll put up with it for so long, and she always say, and she goes, "Papa, I only believe you when you preach. If you're not preaching, I'm not believing a word you're saying." <laughs> so what I'm saying is, I'm preaching right now, and uh, <laughs> you can believe what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> oh, Penelope, she's a hoot. She will grow up and run some world somewhere one day. <laughs> Deuteronomy 29, 29 says secret things belong to God. And those things are to reveal belong unto us and to our children forever. The secret things, the, the things that it's not necessarily something that, that is not there. It's just something that we don't comprehend, perceive, understand, and there's a confusion about it. And in, in, in the concept of being a history maker, it's easy for us to get confused because of the world system and the way the world comes against us. And especially as a believer, because the minute you start talking about sowing and reaping or seed time and harvest, the world has a major problem with that. But yet they spend their whole life based upon seed time and harvest. We talked about our educational system this morning and our Christian school and what all it means to have the Christian integrity and character that is taught to our children along with the reading, writing, and arithmetic. But we understand something this morning. If I heard correctly, we start with two-year-olds. And if I heard it correctly, they start out with a structured program when the two-year-olds come to school. And in that structure of program, they begin to put seeds into these children. They can't read at two years old, but four years old going into kindergarten, they can read. Why? Because seeds have been sown in them for two years. 
See, we, we need to understand seed time and harvest is not about dollars and cents per se. It can include dollars and cents, but it's about lifestyle. The secret of seed time and harvest has been hidden from us. But the world system who will come against it because they say preachers, all they're trying to do is coerce people into giving them money. They do that all day long. All you got to do is look at government programs. All you got to do is look at our, 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 our educational systems. They're always pouring seeds into people to get them to move to a level that they'll do what they want them to do. And so they have to have, if you will, some type of seed put in them, whether it be knowledge, whether, no matter what it be, whether it be emotions or whatever, so that as they grow up, they begin to develop a harvest in their lives, which is called their ability to produce. My wife kind of gets upset at me because every time we're in the car and we come by a, 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 a person that's out in the road and they're, they're dirty and they got their signs out and they're asking for money and working, haven't been working, I'm hungry, I'm all of that. And I, and I always say it, I, and I say it to my grandkids too because I want them to understand. I said, you know what's sad? It breaks my heart because they, they weren't born that way. They were not born that way, but they were born into something that sowed seeds into them that they allowed a harvest to come into their lives and because no one ever taught them what was right from wrong. They got caught up in things. They, they, or they had a poor self-identity, so they get into the drug same world or they get into the pornographic world or, or, they, or they get into all these. Why? Because they have a poor self-image. Consequently, where did it come from? The seeds that were sown into their lives. And whether we like it or not, we are today, based upon the seeds that we have allowed to be sowed in our lives, the seeds that we've allowed to be put into our lives, and the seeds that we've sown, that's who you are today. I tell people all the time, you need to pray for a crop failure and start planting new seed. Because God is not mocked what sort man soweth, that shall he also reap. Secret to understanding the revelatory insight. First Corinthians chapter two, verses nine and ten. I have not seen, ear, have not heard, or entered to the heart of man the things that God has prepared for you. Look at the person next to you and say, God's got something for you. You just have to see it. You cannot be a history maker if you keep looking with the natural eye. The natural eye just looks at natural things but the spiritual eye looks at the supernatural the natural eye looks into the world in which we live the supernatural eye looks into the fourth dimension where God lives we've got to begin to move in that spiritual dynamic as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God we need to begin to act like God 1 Corinthians 2 9 through 10 I have not seen ears not heard in the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them God has something prepared for you that you haven't seen yet. I'm in a process. I, I, I've been in ministry 51 years now. And I'm in a process just discovering some things that I should have known years ago, but I never saw it. Based upon the fact of the way I was brought up, what I was exposed to. And I was never in a position that I could identify what God was trying to show me. And when I saw it, I go, I can't believe I waited. Have you ever said that? I can't believe I've waited this long. Because you didn't see it. But once you saw it, whew, let's keep moving. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, it says, now faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is substance of something that is you have an anticipation for, an expect, expectation for, the evidence of things not seen. So the substance can't be a natural substance because you can't see it. Come on, stay with me, folks. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. I don't believe that. Quit breathing. You're breathing what you can't see. You're listening on a sound system that you can't see the sound waves. Now, they can come in and they can put things on it and they can identify them, but you can't see them. You'll go outside and you feel the wind blowing, but you can't see it. Don't talk to me about you don't deal with anything that you can't, if I can't see it, I, no. There's a lot of things you can't see. So you've got to identify it from a different level. So you stop, so when I talk about the wind blowing, I'm not talking about from a natural level because I can't see it in the natural. I can only see the results of it. I can't see it in self. Come on, folks, stay with me. But by the word of God, 
God will paint pictures on the canvas of your mind that you can begin to see what the natural man cannot see. We call it vision. In the book of Genesis, in in chapter 15, it says in verse 1, it says, after these things. What things? He's talking about chapter 14. Why from 14? He gave the Melchizedek tithe of all. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he gave him tithe of all. The Bible says in Malachi, if you bring tithe, I open the windows of heaven. What are the windows for? They're for seeing. What is he pouring out? Revelation. After Abraham had never tithed until that time. He'd given offerings, he'd built altars, but he'd never given a tithe. But the moment he gave him his tithe, remember, and he had a promise. Everybody remember this. You can have a promise, but if you can't see it, you can't possess it. Every promise in the book is mine. Big deal if you can't see them. You just got a lot of rhetoric. Hmm. Abraham gave tithe. It said the word of the Lord came to him in a vision. 15 chapter 1 after that. Now his eyes are going to be open. He says now look at the stars. What do you see? All of a sudden, the stars look different because they look like his kids. Can you number them? I can't number them. He says, so shall your children be, your descendants be. He began to look and see, not with a natural eye. So my question is, what are you looking at? And with what eye do you see with? See, if we're going to be history makers... You have to understand, history makers, they see things differently. We go through our life and we, we, we see people who's, who's made the, the difference in our lives. Genesis 14, 18, we talked about tithe. 15, 1, we talked about the fact that then God said, after you see what you've got, bring an offering. Why, why would God tie two together? One is for revelation, the other one is for manifestation. It says, when they brought the tithe, or when Abraham brought tithe to God, in the book of Malachi, it says, we are making covenant with God by giving him our tithe. But when he gave him the offering in the book of of Genesis chapter 15, God walked amongst the offering. God began to give him revelation to what was going to happen 400 years down the road to the children of Israel. And then it said something very unique in that passage. It said, now God made covenant with him. So your tithe is when you bring your tithe, God says this. He says, you make covenant with me. And because you make covenant with me, you now have access to see things the way I see them. But with your offering, you've told me that you believe now in what you see. Oh, God, faith without works is dead. You believe now in what you see. And because you now believe in what you see, I have to make covenant with you. Mm. I have to bring into the world in which you live that which you now see. Glory. That's why prayer, praise, and presentation is so important. That's why we've done the, the, the daily seed, why we, why we do the kingdom builders on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, with each day representing family and self and, and all that. You can go back and look at the envelope. But what I want to see is this, is it because every day we start every day off with prayer, praise, and presentation. Some of you that are new to our church, maybe you've never seen it, when people come up and bring their offering and they put it up here and we don't pass the collection plate for our, our tithe and offering, you say, well, why not? Because we believe that, that, first off, we believe tithe and offering is worship. It's a type of prayer, praise, and presentation. You say we go to the house of prayer. We give our tithe, showing that we thank God that he's the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And now we saw our offering declaring that God has shown us what is ours, and now he has to manifest it for us. See, when you make a covenant with me, it's a commitment on your part. But when I make a covenant with you, it's a commitment on my part. And we got this nonsense in the church that God doesn't owe me anything. Oh, yes, he does. Not because of you, but because of what Christ did on the cross. Don't get caught up with yourself. 
So when we see this, let me move on, unless I, I digress. Let me move on here. So we begin to move into this arena of being a, a, a history maker. We know this, that he, he says that the kingdom of God, in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 7 to 31, he, he talks about, about the kingdom of God and how it's going to manifest itself with a rich young ruler. This rich young ruler had everything going his way. He was rich. And Jesus said to him, your problem is, you put your trust in your riches. You don't put your trust in me. You need to start giving of your riches and trust me. And of course, we've read it in the, in the translators. They didn't have to translate it. So in the original text, it doesn't say it that way. But in the, in the New Modern and the King James and the, all of the other translations, they, they, they say, go sell everything you got. And it gives the concept and give it away. He didn't tell him to give it away. He said, start giving what you have. And the rich young ruler was sad, and he walked away. Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of God. Disciples were astonished. But then he turns around and he says, but know this. Rich people can make it into heaven because all things are possible with God. And they said to him, Peter said to him, well, then who, how can we make it? Now, I know I, I go against the total doctrine of the church. Just do me a favor. Get this in your spirit. Say this to the person next to you. Whether you like it or not, the disciples were rich. <laughs> I don't have time to go through this. I can take you to every disciple and show you where they were and where they came from. Someone said, well, they left it all. Peter said he left it all. Yeah, he did. I, I went to... Uh, Pittsburgh, just outside of Boston, this past week, and spoke with Pastor Brian and, and, and his wife Jessica. Wonderful, wonderful church, wonderful people. I left all of you here. I left you in care of him. <laughs> he did a good job, didn't he? <clears throat> but I left you. My wife was with me. I left her. I leave her all the time. It doesn't mean you're not going back. It means I'm not going to let this moment stop me from fulfilling what God called me to do. So Jesus said, there's no one who's left houses, homes, land, family, and for the sake of the, in other words, to preach the gospel, that we're not receiving this life a hundredfold. A full, the word hundredfold means we're not receiving this life full capacity, which means that if I'm willing to make sure the gospel is priority in my life, then I'm going to have the best family in the world. My business is going to flourish. He said this to Peter. He says, you're not left at all for the sake of the gospel that you will not receive in this lifetime a hundredfold return or full capacity along with persecution. Because people hate other Christians who are successful when they're not. And it's not the world that persecutes you, it's the believers. So you got to have a self-identity when you walk in here. I'm not, I love you, and I love you I, with the love of the Lord, but I'm not going to let what you think about me decide who I am. The sowing of a seed, the, 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 the giving of a seed, history makers. Our whole history has been based upon that. Martin Luther King walked away from his family and everything else as he went out and marched the streets and ended up giving his life. But he did it because he was a history maker. He said, I refuse to renege on what I know the truth is. He said, I, remember, what you know, remember the, 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 the uh, message? I've been to the mountain. I've seen little Black boys and white boys and black girls and white girls and people of color holding hands and singing and being there. I've seen it. We still have people in our world today who can't see it. We stay divided because people don't have a revelation of what Dr. Martin Luther King had. But he says, I refuse to change even when they put a gun to his head and shot him. He died, but look at what lived. The legacy of the seeds he sowed to this very day. Yeah. History makers, they understand 
They count the cost, Luke 14, 28 through 30. You don't build a house that you don't count the cost to make sure you have what it takes to finish that building or don't start it and embarrass yourself. We already talked about tithe demonstrates our belief in God. Offerings demonstrate our belief in God's word. John 14, 15, 15 says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. James 2, 17 and 2, 26, faith without works is dead. It tells us in the book of Psalms that we should have great expectation. In Psalm 62, 5 and 7, put that up on the screen, please. Psalms chapter 62. My soul waits silently for God alone for my expectation is what? I'm going to just leave it right there. There's other verses there. I'm going to leave it right there. My expectation is from who? So why would I allow someone to interfere with my expectation? Faith. Faith is you as a heartfelt belief that God is who he said he is and God will do what he said he would do. Amen? Amen. Correct? So, by faith, I have substance of things what hope for. The word hope there is things that you expect. Favorable expectation. Favorable expectation. I went to the gas station, $5.30 a gallon. And that's not even the high test. It bothers me. But I have no fear that I will not be able to pay whatever it costs for gas. Because God is my source. I didn't st- now, now, say with me now, I didn't start out as God is my source when the gas went up. I walked in this thing in ministry for 51 years. I've been a Christian since I was 19 years old. It's taken me almost 60 years to learn how to believe God in things. I'm not running to the hills because of what's going on in our country today of all the difficult things that are happening. I know that God is going to have his greatest moment before Jesus comes back. See, I know that he said the church is going to get so blessed. You need to read your Bible. It's going to get so blessed that even the Jewish nation will become jealous of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read your Bible. Well, I I know the end times. I'm worried about end times because your Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. The Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise. We which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet him in the air. I want you to know something. That, That little song, I'll Fly Away, carries a lot of meaning to me because I have an expectation that no matter how bad it gets, number one, the righteous have not been forsaken and they have not been begging for bread. Number two, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Number three, I know no weapon formed against me can prosper. I know that the enemy comes one way. He's got to flee seven ways. Consequently, you can't put me in the tribulation and cause me to tribulate because I was not designed for that. And I know I was not designed for that because I know what the Word of God says about that. So my expectation didn't come because I heard somebody say something. It came because I've walked in it for over 60 years and I've learned to walk by faith and not by sight. I want to be a history maker. I don't want to be just somebody who's passing by. I live with expectation. Been a crazy year. My wife and I, we've made some commitments and made some decisions on some things. And of course, going through the COVID year, really COVID years, and then coming back into this year, and things are kind of kind of getting back into into place. And but we still didn't really start setting up any kind of engagements that we go out and do speaking at times and sell our books and things of that nature, and which has been a blessing to us on an income basis, to be honest with you, so we can do what God's called us to do. But we didn't have any place January and February this year. 
March. I had somebody call me up and they, they, they said about this. I said, we're going to do it. This is a commitment we're going to make. And of course, the enemy comes along. Well, you're not speaking anywhere. Where are you going to get the money for that? I said, well, it's not my job to get the money. God said he'll give seed to the sower. Yeah. It's my job to commit to what God put in my heart to do. Right. So I get a letter in the mail and there's a bunch of money. Then I have a guy fly into town. Said, I need to talk to you. I said, man, I can't. It was right in the middle of some, when my, my, my mother-in-law had passed away and a lot of stuff going on. I said, I cannot. He says, all I need, I'll just ride by. He just flew in. He said, I'll just, I want to ride by with a friend of mine. Let me see you just for three minutes. Okay, I'm on my way out the door. I'm going to my car. They pull up in a parking lot. Rolls down the windows. How you doing, Bishop? How you doing? He says, you can't believe God's been speaking to me. Here, he hands me a check for thousands of dollars. I said, what's that for? He says, God just told me to get it. I had to fly down here and give it to you. I couldn't wait another day. You know you're in the right place when people have to run you down. You know, another thing in the mail, $5,000. Another thing in the mail, $1,500. I mean, this is crazy. So we could meet all of our commitments because God gives seed to the sower. But how is that, how can it be possible? Because I never doubted whether we could do it because I heard from God. God told us to do these things. So I knew it was coming. I didn't know where it was coming from. It's not my job to figure out where it's coming from. It's my job to walk in expectancy. Mm. We doing okay this morning? I know I'm kind of being a little rough in some ways, but I, I just, it's time, church. This is our greatest season. Don't miss it. Don't let it pass you by. Expectation. You, 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 if, without faith, you're going to please God. But he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He will reward those. There's ways you look ahead. Sowing and reaping, as I've already pointed out. Genesis 8, 22, as long as your earth remains seed time and harvest. Such as the kingdom of God, Mark 4, 26, as if a man should scatter seed. Go to bed and get up in the morning. He doesn't know how it does. God, God causes the seed to grow, but he watches the blade, and then he watches the stalk, and then he watches the ear, and then he harvests. So my job is to sow and harvest and walk in faith. I sow. I'm walking in faith. I, I harvest. My job is not to figure out how it's going to happen. The sowing of a seed is the beginning of all things. If you're taking notes... The earth was created with the sowing of seed by the word of God. The word of God, the sower sows the seed of the word. The sowing of a seed is the beginning of all things by earth, spirit, salvation, and success. Without the seed, you can't operate in the, in the earth and be successful. You can't live by the spirit without Jesus Christ and be saved without Jesus Christ, who is the only begotten son of God. He is the incorruptible seed. You can't walk in success because everything produces after its own kind. If you're not ready to take what you have and put in, don't expect God to have what he has and put in. Seed is the power to create life and influence and destiny. The power to create. I'm miserable with my life then. What are you giving of your life? Well, I don't have any money. I didn't ask you that. Who did you give a kind word today? Who did you pray for today? Who did you help today? I often wonder about people. I was, we were coming to church this morning and there was a light was, traffic light was red, and then all of a sudden the light, a little green thing came off of the people next to us to turn, and this one guard went to pull up and stop, and the cars behind them were beeping at them, and, and I looked up, and I'm going, what, because they're not going, I said, they, I looked, and here's this person who's got this older, older person with a cane who can hardly walk, that's walking across the crossway, so this car refused to go on the green light because he wanted to wait till the end, and I'm thinking these other people are beeping. You don't understand. The person who stopped is creating a legacy for their children's children. The people that are beeping are creating a legacy also. But one is going to be good and one's not going to be so good. Seed you so. They didn't realize that it was a great opportunity for seed time and harvest. It causes you to bring influence. It said when the, when the righteous, <laughs> when they are in charge, it says the people rejoice. When the righteous are are walking in the blessings of God, then they become an influence to the world in which they live. Destiny, the principle that will identify purpose 
is found in the sowing of a seed. We won't find destiny without the sowing of a seed. Adam and Eve were told this, you be fruitful, multiply, and replenish, and then you walk into minionship or you're never going to make it. The minute that they touched what was not, or ate what was not theirs, they lost their destiny. Whew. We don't stop and think about that too much, do we? God said, what's for a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He's not, God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. The protocol that produces seasons, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, the sowing of a seed produces seasons. To everything there is a season. The vehicle of visionaries is the sowing of a seed. Look at Matthew 25. Or look, at, look at the talent story of the man who brings his, his, his servants to him. He gives one five. He gives another one two. He gives another one based upon their ability to produce. The one with five doubled. The one with two doubled. The one with one, he says, you're a wicked servant. I didn't give you something you couldn't handle, but you refused to use the things that I taught you to cause that to multiply. Take it from him and give it to the one. And the wealthy always get wealthy, don't they? Don't you love poor people who say that? Well, it's always a wealthy there, always getting theirs. Well, why don't you get yours? It's so easy to, to, to make the excuse and stop being a, a, a history maker and start being a part of the, the I love it. We're team players. I'm of the team of God, but I'm not of the team of men. And I just messed somebody up. I'm on the team with God. If you're in the body of Christ where he's called you and you're fulfilling your purpose and destiny where God's called you, then we're good. But don't come to me and act like a hand when you're nothing but a big toe. And ask me to participate. Come on, stay with me, folks. Let's go a little bit further. He says this, that when we talk about these things, that the protocol that produces the seasons, it says the vehicle of visionaries, Matthew 25, 14. It's the will of God in motion in Genesis 1, 28. Be fruitful, multiply, and finish. It's the power to bring about transformation or transforming the circumstances you live in. Jesus said, hey, we got to feed these people. They're hungry. And the little, uh, the, uh, Andrew says, we can't feed them. Even if we had the money, we, we, we can't go. But there's a little a lad, he loaves and fish. He said, fine. You see, you want to solve a problem and meet a need. He said, what I want to do is change a generation. You can get so need motivated that you bring about no change. The world knows that. You can give a man a fish if he's hungry, or you can teach him to fish and he'll feed himself for a lifetime. But we in the church struggle with that kind of stuff. We have a difficult time with it. Sowing of a seed is an expression of man's faith in God's word. I believe what God said to me. Three questions, I wrote this down just for those that know this, but I'm going to move ahead. Three questions you need to ask. Will it glorify God when I sow a seed? Will it bless others and will it benefit me? Will it glorify God? Will it bless others? Will it benefit me? When it calls God to be glorified, he said in the book of John, the 15th chapter, that when we bear much fruit, God is glorified. He says in Matthew, he says over there in chapter 5, he says, they shall see your good works and glorify God. So what seed did I sow of my time, my talent, my energy, will it glorify God? It's real simple. Wherever you find yourself in any setting, what am I doing right now? Will it cause God to be glorified? Number two, will it benefit the people that are around me? Would it cause somebody to feel value? Would it cause somebody to feel accepted? Would it cause somebody to feel loved? Will it benefit people I'm around? I mean, are you one of those people that walk into a room and everybody goes, oh, God, here they go. <laughs> are you one of those people you walk in a room and everybody's going, hey, man, how you doing? Come over here. Because they know that in your presence, they're going to be uplifted. In your presence, you're going to make them feel good. In your presence, you're going to put value on them. As we've always said, go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. And number three, will it benefit me? Oh, that bothers people. I'm not doing it for me. Too bad. I don't want anything from God, stupid. Dumb, 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 dumb. 
And it's the very people who tell you they received Jesus to get saved. I don't want to be from God. I got Jesus because I want to be saved. Well, you're just lying. Because you wanted Jesus so your sins would be forgiven. So you wanted something from God who gave his only begotten son. And now you said, I don't want to get, give anything from God. Make up your mind, in or out. Lukewarmness is spewed out of his mouth. You ever wonder in Revelation where he talks about that? The lukewarm spewed out. Why? The lukewarm means they don't know what they want. They don't know what they believe. What did David say about killing Goliath? Not one time did he say, I think I can kill him. Let me figure this out. I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. What did he say? He says, question. You got this giant out here and all you are hiding behind rocks. And, and I, I just want to know, before I go out and do this deed, what's in it for the man who does it? Why? He says, I'm not going to kill the giant without expectation. Oh, stay with me, folks. I'm not going to kill the giant without expectation. I'm not going to do something without expectation. What's in it for me? Why? Because everything produces after its own kind. What are men soweth, that shall he also reap. Consequently, it's impossible for you to do anything that doesn't produce a harvest. So decide what harvest you want and find out what it is. Identify it. Identify my harvest. Yeah. Absolutely. If I want people to be nice to me, I'm nice to people. If I want favor, I'm showing favor wherever I go. If I want to be encouraged, I encourage people. If I want to be blessed, I bless people. What is man's responsibility to seed time and harvest? It's found in Matthew 22, 36 to 39, the great commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Oh, come on, just go, I love you. You're so good. Some of you go, I'm not doing that. That's a problem. You don't love yourself. I like me. Whether you like me or not, I like me. I enjoy my company. I'm not joking. I don't have to have a bunch of people because I like me so much. But watch this now. But because I love God with all of my heart, and because I've learned to love me and like me, I'm going to have a bunch of people around me because I'm going to love them the way God would love them. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love people. Go out of your way. Go out of your dimension and love people. Love God, love yourself, you can love your neighbor. I know it's not popular. A lot of religious people don't like that. Well, I don't believe that. Well, that's okay. You don't have to believe it. It doesn't change the word of God. It's just you have decided to take a philosophy rather than what God said. And the worst thing you can do is say, I believe in God, but don't believe his word. Giving is a lifestyle. Give it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over in good measure. You sow in faith, you represent what I believe. I sow with expectation, it represents what I see. I sow in obedience, it represents who do I serve. I sow, uh, it says in the book of Genesis, Abraham, he, 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 he sowed, and God began to open the windows of heaven. Genesis 26 and 12, Isaac sowed in the time of famine. We look in Psalms 126, 5 through 6, the people of God sowed in tears. John 12 and 3, Mary sowed in, bro in brokenness. Luke 2, 21, 1 through 4, the widow sowed in poverty. John 3, 16, God sowed in love. Musicians come. If we do the difficult, and you've heard me teach this a hundred times from this platform, I, I just wanted to register this morning for a moment. If we do the difficult, that means it's not easy. You're in sports, right? What do you do? It's track? What do you run? 800, 400. So when you go to practice, what do you do? You do workouts? Is the coach there? Does he make you do things? Sometimes you don't want to do it. 
oh, I see, that if you're willing to do the difficult for the coach, you probably can win your tournament eventually because he sees something in you. Because if he didn't believe you could be a winner, he wouldn't be coaching you. So if we do the difficult, man, God does the impossible. We act on what we believe, but God acts on his word. I said we act on what we believe. Don't go looking around at people. Look in the mirror. What do you believe? Because that's why you're supposed to live your life. We act on what we believe, and God always acts on his word. The possessor of a seed has authority to bring about change. Still talking history makers here. All with a seed. How do I change history with a seed? The possessor of a seed has authority to bring about change. They have the right to be a leader and not a follower. We'll let that sink in a minute. Oh, the world understands that. It's called the golden rule, the one with the gold rules. Come on, you know what I'm saying. You have the right to be a leader, not a follower. The sowing of a seed is the foundation of strength by which you can endure difficulty. See, if I'm a sower of the seed, I realize I got to do the difficult. So therefore, I can endure the season of difficulty. Why? Because I know God is not mocked. What's your man soweth? That shall he also reap. But everybody's turned against me. Don't worry about it. That must mean that if they're not going to see you for who you are, God's about to wipe that out and give you a whole new group of friends. Glory to God. We try so hard to keep people around us, and we should just let down some go. Freedom, so you're going to see it is freedom or independence to make your own decision. I can make my own. See, see, when I put my time in in school and I graduate from high school, and I'm the valedictorian. I can pick any college I want. I can make that decision. Rather than barely get by in school and have to go to some junior school somewhere because nobody else will accept me. Now you're letting the world tell you who you are and what you are rather than you. I'm just saying this to some of our young people here today. What I am willing to sow will determine my future possibilities. If I'm willing to work in the parking lot and be faithful, David took care of the sheep, but look where David went. Never look at where you are as the end result. It's just a stepping stone. My destiny is never found in my past. It's never found in my past. So quit looking over your shoulder. I've never been able, you're never going to do it either because you keep looking over your shoulder. It will only be defined by the seeds that I sow for my future. We've already said I'm the sum total of the seeds I've sown. The sowing of a seed gives recognition to a harvest which has not (laughs) yet been revealed to the senses, to the natural man, but has become mandated by the law kingdom of God a farmer when he sows his seed is always looking at his harvest isn't that funny a teacher when they sow the seeds of education are always looking at the kids not as they are but what they can be oh come on stay with me folks an investor is never looking at how much he cost him He's looking at how much it will produce. A successful marriage is never based upon it's all about me, but it's about me seeing how God has put the two together as one to be able to operate with incredible success. Folks, I I know I've gone against some of the traditions today. But we have to be history makers. And I've given you over 20 different things today.
that if you will apply it, it'll change the world in which you live. My grandfather, my dad's father, you've heard me tell the story, it was a very successful contractor. Back in the day, he was building hospitals and schools and building homes on the beach in St. Augustine. He was one of those guys, he had a brand new home in the middle of St. Augustine, three running bathrooms in, inside the house, not outside, this is back in the 20s, new vehicles and cars. He had to make a lot of money, he had 15 kids. The crash of 29 came and the world turned upside down. My dad heard somebody crying in the front part of the house. He ran around. My grandfather was sitting on the steps of the house, and he was weeping. He had his head between his legs, and he was weeping. And he said, the banks are closed. The market is cashed. I can't get money to pay for the materials that I've ordered, and I can't pay my help. We've lost everything, and we'll never get it back. It's funny how words become seeds. Through the years, every child in that family went to success. And they all died with heart conditions, cancer, and they all died broke. My dad, four heart attacks, my mom, cancer, living in a townhouse with me that the church provided me as a youth pastor. I began to study and began to seek the mind of God and then to talk to my brother time, my brother Eric. I said, Eric, something's wrong. And I went to my dad. I had him tell me the story over and over again. I said, Dad, Grandpa invited the demonic spirit of destruction and death to our family. My grandfather died at age 61. All my other uncles and aunts were dying at age 59, 60, and 61. My dad, by the time 59, he had four heart attacks, less than 30% of his heart operational. We made a decision. We were going to pray for crop failure. We took authority over the demonic spirit, that seed of destruction and death. We broke it off of our parents. We said, we're not doing this. Someone handed my dad three books by Ken Copeland, The Laws of Prosperity, The Troublemaker, and The Force of Righteousness. He read those books and he said, I never look back over my shoulder again. I realized my whole past had been controlled by the seeds of doubt and destruction and religious mindset. I am who God says that I am. Sat in a meeting in Lakeland, Florida, 1,600 people. He sat in the middle of the church, didn't know the preacher. He was evangelist. He walked out, looked at the crowd, walked down to the middle, called my mom and dad out. Told my dad exactly how many heart attacks he had. Told exactly what was wrong with his heart. Told me that God's healing him today. He prayed to him. And my dad went out of the power of God. He prayed for my mother. She said, this thing has never come back on you. She never suffered again from any kind of disease or cancer of any kind. Totally set free. As they're on the floor, he went to walk away, turn around. He says, and you're going back into ministry. But what he didn't know is that before dad had gotten there, he'd gone to Lake Ida and had his encounter with God. And God had told him he was going back into ministry, but he didn't know how he was going to do it. But the conversation he had with God was based on the prodigal son. My dad argued with God. He said, I'm not the prodigal son. I've never left you from the day I received Christ. I never turned my back on you. I've never done drugs. I've never slept with a bunch of women. I've only slept with one woman in my life. I've served you all the days of my life since I was 15 years of age. I'm not the prodigal son. And God said, no, you're not. You're the elder brother. All that I had has always been yours. You just didn't know how to use it. Did y'all get that? All that I had has always been yours. You just didn't know how to use it. Hmm. Now he's in Lakeland. He's called out. He's healed. He comes back and he starts the church with borrowed money. He borrowed $1,000. That's all he could get because he had no credit. With $1,000. He sowed a seed for the future. And here we are, 26 churches later. 
multi-million dollar complex. This church has given millions of dollars to missions. Last week, two weeks ago, you gave over $38,000 roughly to Fire Bible. Which means that from since the beginning of this year, between that and what we sown before we got to that, we've already given them almost sixty thousand dollars for fire Bible this year. You know why? We refuse to let circumstance define our future because we know who we are. When my dad found out who he was, he said, "I can reverse the curse with the seeds that I sow." Part a thousand dollars started a church. Two years later, we were going to need to do something. The church had grown so fast and was so big that we needed $100,000 to put down on a property. We were at a meeting, and Wright Thompson was preaching in Miami, Florida, Trinity Assembly of God. He said, we're building churches in India. We need $10,000 a church. My dad looked at me, and I looked at him. He said, we've got $10,000. That's how much we've collected in the last two years in our building fund. Let's give it to India. We built a church in India. And a little girl who had never knew who his grandmother was because the grandmother had disowned her mother when she got married, didn't like her father. Never talked to her grandmother, never met her. Her grandmother had died. She's the only living relative. They contacted her and said, you only really have everything the grandmother had is yours and she was a multimillionaire. So she sent the check for $100,000. But it started with a seed of 10. And it started with a seed of 1,000. Don't tell me seed time and harvest doesn't work. The way you become a history maker is you learn how to take your time, your talent, your abilities, and your finances and know how to sow them. Will it glorify God? Will it bring value to others? And will it bless me? History makers understand. To change the world in which we live. Hey, thanks for watching the Abundant Life YouTube channel. We hope that today's message has blessed your life. And don't forget, if you enjoyed today's sermon, you can always subscribe as well as share this message with your family and friends. Also, to support the ministry, be sure to hit the giving link located in the description below. Through your giving, we're able to continue to spread the gospel and reach our world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Also, you can join us Sundays for all of our stream services on Facebook Live and AbundantLife.tv. And remember this, that God is a good God. He loves you and He wants to bless you today. Take care.